So welcome to your relationship after baby. Um, as you just heard, we are recording our sessions. So um, we're going to offer time at the end for questions after the presentation, but you're welcome to use the chat during the session and um, just keep your mics muted and use the hand raise reaction during the Q&A so that we can call on you to uh, ask questions. Um, to access the slides and handouts, you can find them in the documents tab in the Whova app or on the website and under session documents. And then you'll find a link and you can follow along there. And the notes page in the program for this session is on uh, page 26. I'm going to introduce our speaker to you now, Dr. Kara English. She is the founder and CEO of Tara's Tribe at the Cummings Graduate Institute for Behavioral Health Studies. She has 20 years of experience in the fields of psychology, counseling, and integrated behavioral health care. And the mission of Tara's Place is to serve women and families suffering from perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Kara's educational background includes a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from ASU, a master's degree in counseling from NAU and a doctor, doctor of behavioral health from ASU. Kara's counseling experiences include partnering with families from many cultures and backgrounds. She's passionate about empowering mothers and their partners to make informed decisions about their care that are in line with family, cultural, and spiritual values. And I don't know about all of you, but everything changed after I had my baby, especially my relationships. So let's dive in with Dr. English. Please take it away. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay? All right. Can you see my screen okay? All right, good. All right, thank you everyone for joining um, this session today. Uh, um, I completely agree with Kendra, my relationship changed completely and it wasn't just with my partner, it was really my relationships with everyone in my life. And so today's presentation will be talking about your relationship with your significant other, your partner, um, and many of the tools and strategies and information that I share will be also relevant to other significant important relationships in your life, including with your other children um, or with your new baby, and um, can also be um, helpful for you with work relationships, friendships, um, family relationships, et cetera. So I hope that many of you who've come today are, are ready to think a little bit different about how we cultivate our relationships as, as well as um, decrease the stress um, for ourselves, as well as how do we address stress together as a couple. So uh, Find Your Shine Therapy has a great Instagram page. They often post some really excellent content. So I highly recommend following them if you're an Instagrammer. Um, and one of the shares that they posted recently was this part about things that don't necessarily mean your relationship is unhealthy. Um, so, you know, having butterflies wearing off, feeling like there's not a complete balance or equivalency in your relationship, feeling like you'd like to spend time alone, wanting time away from your partner, having complete differences in, in sexual attraction or, or sexual libido, um, getting into arguments, feeling like you're in a rut, wondering if this is even the right relationship for you. Should we even be married? Should we even have had a baby? These are all completely normal and very common questions that um, people ask themselves, especially when they're going through pregnancy or, or after baby comes and not just in the first year after baby. It's a very normal thing for us to go through in our relationship over time. So if you're here because you have any of these fears and you're thinking maybe this means that my relationship is unhealthy, just know that it is part of every relationship and it's probably going to be fine. There are some strategies that can help you deepen your emotional connection to one another and help improve communication that we'll talk about. In the fourth trimester book, which I highly recommend, the author's name is Kimberly A. Johnson. Um, you can find it on Amazon or other booksellers. She talks about how if we would just as a society think about and talk about and plan for the fourth trimester and beyond, 
to the degree that we do prepare for pregnancy and, and the birth itself, then our society would probably be a different place to live in. Um, women would be less depressed, couples would survive the first year more easily, and babies would probably be calmer. So we're gonna talk about what she means today. A lot of the, what I'm gonna tell you and, and a lot of what I'm gonna share with you today comes from research by the Gottmans or the Gottman Institute, which is a national expert um, couple in couples and relationships. They uh, founded the Gottman Institute uh, after beginning to research marriage stability and observing couples in what they called the love lab. So they would watch couples for extended periods of time. Couples would come and stay and they would watch them in day-to-day -day interactions and do what we call observational research, which is just watching people function and communicate with one another. And then, you know, they kind of researched and, and looked for patterns over time. Um, and you can look at some of their research uh, by, the, by checking out the website here, um, but I'm gonna share a lot of it with you today. So the research, you know, one of the things I wanna say again is just to keep it real, um, the Gottmans have found over 40 years of looking at couples that 67%, that's a high percentage of couples, um, had a, the sense of their relationship deteriorating over time in the first year after having their child. And so in the first three years, ma uh, marriage satisfaction dropped within 67% of couples. And in the 33% of relationships that weathered that change, meaning they didn't separate or divorce, they seem to do so with preparation, forethought, and skillful communication. So when I was looking at those three things, I was thinking, what in the world do those even mean? That's pretty vague. So I'm gonna talk about that specifically, what does preparation look like? So one of the questions that Dr. Robin Wilhelm asked was, "How? what kind of communication um, can we do before pregnancy or during pregnancy before baby comes to strengthen and improve communication? So I also follow the Gottman Institute on Instagram and they also produce some, some really great content. And um, as I was preparing for the conversation, they gave me this little gift of producing these posts that said, before baby arrives, what we discussed included what kind of stroller car seat to buy, our budget for the nursery, how we wanted to decorate, um, our maternity and newborn photos and, and favorite baby names and a birth plan. And I went, yep, me too. My husband and I did all those things. But what couples really wish that we would have discussed after we have baby are things like knowing how mental health isn't right, how, what are the signs and symptoms, and, and then what should I do about it? Or better yet, what should my partner do about it? If my partner's noticing those things in me, how do I even bring that up without making her feel like a bad mom? Um, how parenting duties are shared, what are some chores? Um, what is our expectation of the chores that need to be done on a week to week basis? How do we support each other? And you know, how, if we're not having sex, what, what can we do still that feels okay in terms of touch? What touch is okay? And if I feel touched out as a mom, how can my partner not take that personally? and create a, a situation that doesn't need to be created by just understanding you know, what I'm going through in my body a little bit better. Um, what is a budget for mental health support? So this is something that often happens, especially for couples who are trying to do self-pay. We'll budget for a nursery, we'll budget for a stroller, we'll budget for um, you know, the birth, and maybe we'll do um, out-of-pocket pay for a doula but there's no budget left when it comes to mental health support. And as it turns out, that mental health support might be a whole lot more helpful to the couple and the family than a budget for a nursery. So just kind of knowing about this, thinking about it, talking about it with your partner. Um, and you can look at a lot of these other things. And I, and I actually highly recommend that you do look at these if you're pregnant right now and that you talk about each of these things with your partner. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, how talking about these kinds of things and coming to shared values and creating a plan around how to address these kinds of things as a team makes a huge difference in your relationship. 
So the fourth trimester book that I mentioned before by Kimberly Johnson has a couple bubble exercise. And when I first was reading this, it brought a smile to my face because in the year after I had my son, my husband and I were in such a blind rush all the time that I felt like I was more living with a roommate than I was living with my husband, my partner, this person that I decided and consciously chose to have a child with. And um, every great once in a while, we would find ourselves in the shower together out of a necessity. Like, and our, our um, statement was, I'm gonna take a two second shower, just a two second shower, because that was what we felt at the time we could ask or say that we needed, two seconds, if you can believe that. So we know a lot more now than we did then. But when we found ourselves in the shower, he would often just put his hands on my shoulder or hug me and say, just for 60 seconds, let's just stay in this bubble. And I didn't realize it at the time because sometimes I would be annoyed and in a hurry and I'd be like, I don't have time for this. But inevitably my shoulders would drop and I would remember what I was practicing, which was let me come back to my intention of having a healthy relationship with my partner and a healthy family together. And so this exercise and, and some of the prompts that they give can really help you begin to talk and communicate at a deeper level as a couple um, and to come up with a plan for things like, how do you deal with stress? How does your partner deal with stress? How do you recognize stress in each other? How, do you how can you help each other cope with that stress when it's happening? So I highly recommend taking a look at some of these exercises. If you don't wanna buy the book, you can just take a screenshot of these exercises and do them with your partner um, now. And if you happen to be postpartum and you're just learning about this now, that's fine, do them now. And if you happen to be 15 years postpartum like me, that's fine. You can still use these exercises now to deepen your connection with one another and to improve communication and understanding. So the Gottman Institute talks about the four key issues for parents that are really critical to talk about because these often lead to the kinds of breaks in couples that can lead to separation and divorce after baby. Having different parenting styles is not a maybe, it's a most likely. There are gonna be some differences in almost everything about the way that you feel about child rearing with your partner. So whether it is are we okay with sleep co-sleeping or who thinks we should cry it out versus who thinks I should be available to the baby at all times? Or what about the concept of lying in after I have the baby? And what does that mean for what my expectations are of my partner while I'm lying in? So parenting styles are a big one that I highly recommend you talk about. Um, and I have a, a couple that I've been working with who shared with me that at the end of every day, as the, after the kids went to bed, while they were cleaning up the house, they just did a 10 minute check-in with one another about each of their kids. So this particular family had, had five kids. So that's a big purview to cover on a day-to-day -day basis. And in that 10 minutes, as they were cleaning up the kitchen and the dining room, they would just say, well, how do you think my old, our oldest child is doing? What about our youngest? And they would go, you know, from the oldest child all the way to the youngest and just talk about what do you think that child needs? And at the very end, they would ask each other, what do you need from me? Or how can I be more supportive of you? And that sounds like a lot when you're feeling completely exhausted, but in just 10 minutes a day, they really felt as a couple like that was something that fueled and filled their buckets so that when they went to bed the next day, they kind of had an idea of, okay, I'm going to put a little bit more emotional or, or energetic investment into child number three, because that kiddo seems like they're going through something difficult right now. And, or this is one of the ways that I know I can better support my partner tomorrow. Um, the fair distribution of chores is a big one for my husband and I, we had very different ideas about what needed to happen on a daily basis, as well as on a weekend. So I jokingly say that, you know, at, at the beginning, after, after I had my son, I would, you know, get up on a Saturday morning with my child very early. Um, and my husband had a to-do list a mile long in his head and he would just sort of get up and, and get in the car and start like running the errands. And he would go like five different places. 
And by half the day, I've already been awake for a lot of hours alone with the baby, which was kind of how it was all week, but in his mind, which was not what I wanted, but in his mind, he was doing things to help. He felt like that was what he was expected to do. And so sometimes fair distribution of chores isn't something that we talk about and make an intention or a mindful decision about together in a couple partnership. Instead, we bring assumptions or expectations from our family of origin. Like what did the dad do when you were growing up? What did the mom do? What did grandma do? Or what did grandfather do? And, and how was that modeled to you? And is that something you agree with? Is that something you want to continue? Do you want to carry on with that now? And if not, then what do we think? What is, what is our expectation or what is our value? And what do we want to do differently in a mindful way? Um, and this can be, again, like for me, I just have to have a clean kitchen. That, that's really it. If there's laundry piled up and, and the rest of the house isn't very clean, as if the kitchen is clean, I can function. So whether or not the grass has been cut, I could care less. But for him, he really felt like if the grass wasn't cut, he couldn't check that off of his list. And so he didn't feel like he was taking care of his, in his mental um, world. He wasn't taking care of his responsibilities unless that was done. So that was a real thing of discovery because I was making assumptions about him and what we needed to do on my own without ever talking to him and vice versa. So that really was a game changer for us when we were able to say, okay, this is what we agree to. This is what I will take care of because it's important to me. This is what he needs to do because it's important for him. And if the rest of the house is not touched or, you know, as long as everything else that we agree to that we value is moving forward, then we're okay. And we both felt better after that, but it took us years to figure that out. So I highly recommend sitting down and just talking about what that looks like. Changes in intimacy is a big one um, with the couples that I have coming in um, and with the couples that I've worked with over the past several years. Um, I often hear, especially for moms, that they feel a lot of guilt and shame around not being able, feeling touched out and feeling like they're just, they have no libido, they have no interest in sex, um, that they feel like their bucket is completely empty at the end of the day. And very few moms that I've ever worked with felt like they wanted to initiate or even have sex with their partner. Um, and most of the time too, if it became a problem, it was because the partner really took that personally and viewed it as a rejection. And when that happens, that places more judgment and shame on the female partner because even though she's not feeling emotionally or physically ready, which is kind of, in my opinion, like feeling like you have to agree to have sex, which gets really tricky when it comes to consent. And so um, being able as a male partner or the partner of the non you know, the, the non-birthing partner to say, you know, I'm really more interested in how you feel about, you know, do you want this? Is this, you know, or how else can we engage intimately or how else can we get the support that we need to feel like both of us are coming from a sexually healthy and an emotionally healthy and a mentally healthy state again. So talking about that and having really honest, open dialogue um, and for the non-birthing partner to realize what hormonal and physical changes are part of being pregnant and postpartum, being in a pregnant and a postpartum body. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet. There are a lot of great books about that. Um, moms often will ask dads to read articles that they've found that they feel really hits home for them. It really helps them verbalize what's going on inside. And moms often come into me and say, I sent that to my partner. They didn't read it. Um, or I put, I gave him this book and it's been sitting on his, you know, bedside table gathering dust since I gave it to him. And unfortunately, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at the names in the room today, I, I don't see a whole lot of men in the room. Um, so what I recommend, you know, when you are the female partner in this situation is just saying, it's really important to me that you understand what I'm saying and how I'm feeling 
And it would mean the world to me if we could just sit and I, and I could read this to you or we could read it together, that article, and we could have a conversation about what it feels like inside my body right now. I think it would help you understand a lot more. It doesn't always translate 100% into mail, um, but it is at least a start and it can at least improve the understanding. Financial disagreements, we all know, you know, they, they, the statistic that pretty much everybody quotes is that financial disagreements are, are one of the big causes of divorce or separation. Um, and so one of the things that I highly recommend is to, as soon as possible, create a family budget. Um, just look at your income. And if, if this is totally foreign to you, there are some great websites. Um, Dave Ramsey is kind of where, where it started with us. My mom was a big proponent. We never took a class, we just looked at the website. There are some blogs out there and, and they're quick concepts that really helped us create a family budget, look at our income and then look at all of our bills and then look at how can we start to build a savings account so that we, and, and then how can we both get on the same page with what we agree to spend that savings on. Um, and then on a monthly basis, we hold a financial meeting together because believe it or not, you are running a home business together. And if you and your partner aren't looking at the finances together, it gets off track very quickly. I myself am constantly like, wow, I really overspent because I was very mindless. I wasn't being very mindful about the amount that I was eating out when I had that really busy two week period at work. And I ate out way more than I even thought that I did. And I overspent, so that's on me. And so doing things like building strategies around, well, this is how much cash we have in our budget. And so we're gonna take that out of our account. And when the cash is gone, we don't spend anymore. We're on lockdown. Little strategies like that, that can really help um, to reduce the stress around finances so that you feel more confident together that you're on the same page. And then those meetings really help to reduce the stress around how much money do we have, where is it going, um, and are we on track? Um, so I just, let's see if I can, uh, nope. Okay, um, the four Ds is something that um, has been talked about in a couple of other sessions at the um, conference today. And this is what can we delegate, what can we delay, what can we drop, and what what can we do? And often I try to say, what do you both agree to do that is in alignment with your values? And so again, if your family narrative like mine was, well, you know, your great grandmother, your grandmother and your mom kept their house so clean that you could eat off the floor. If your house isn't clean, you might begin to feel like you're not doing what you're supposed to do or failing as a mom. But is that even your value? Do you believe that? Is it true for you? Is it something that you really want? And if it's not, you get to decide that that's not a thing for you. So you get to decide, I can just drop that from the expectation that I have of myself. Like I said, if my kitchen's out of order, like I just can't focus, I gotta clean that kitchen. And I've got it down to a science where in 10 minutes or less, no matter how disgusting it is, I can pretty much get it to a place where I feel good about it again. So really think about that delegate, delay, drop and do. And with your partner, does it align with your values? You know, for each of you, it may differ. You may have some differences, um, but even just having that conversation, like with my husband, I can't tell you how many times I was like, so that home improvement project is the last thing on my list, but you feel like you have to get it done today. And that means I'm not going to see you and neither, you know, like I'll be alone with the kiddo for the entire weekend for weekends and weekends and weekends in a row. But that's not in alignment with our values. Our values are, you know, that after a long week of both of us working, we spend time together as a family and we rest and we recuperate and we fill our buckets. And so if, if that's still at the top of your list and it was one of those things for him, it was just like mindless. He did not understand that it was a thing that prioritizing and I didn't want it. And, and we as a couple didn't want it. It didn't align with our values. So when we were able to really talk about that openly, it shifted everything. Um, so that's just an example of, of one way to kind of think deeply about it. So let's talk about that forethought 
Um, forethought just kind of means before we have a child or before we expand our family, here are some things that we can think about. And again, many of you may already be postpartum and it's fine. Um, it's just, I'm using the language of the Gottmans to kind of you know, conceptualize what we're talking about here. So these are some things that I recommend examining. Uh, one is your emotional heritage. And again, it's, it's looking back in your family lineage and thinking about what you have inherited as a concept of what a good mom is, what a good mom does, what a good marriage looks like, or what a relationship is supposed to look like. Um, and thinking about how were problems handled between your parents or your grandparents or whoever raised you, how problems have been addressed or handled in couples that you know um, in the family? How were emotions handled? Were, were people shut down if they became angry or upset or emotional? Um, were children coached about how to self-regulate if they were upset? And were appropriate limits set on aggression? Or when people became angry, were appropriate limits such as we don't abuse each other physically and we don't abuse each other emotionally. We don't name call. Um, for most of us, that's not all going to be true. Many of us learned bad habits, but again, if we're mindful about it, we can start to heal some of that emotional baggage that we bring with us into our relationships. Counseling is a great option, and I highly recommend it, especially if you've had, if you've experienced what we call adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, you can Google it. There's a lot of great training that's available on adverse childhood experiences and how you know that um, really changes genetically how our bodies respond to stress. Um, and so we know that families that create emotional coaching environments that really teach children how to self-regulate by demonstrating how we are self-regulating ourselves as adults um, leads to children being able to focus in school and navigate friendships more successfully. And that includes romantic relationships as they grow up, um, work relationships with bosses and colleagues. And it also keeps us all healthier because less cortisol in our bloodstream means that we are less susceptible um, and that our immune systems are stronger. So for many of you, you're probably sitting in this room like me. I would have been when just after I had my child saying, oh my God, I must be ruining my child because I haven't done any of this. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. We all come to this when we come to this. And so if this is the first time you've ever heard any of this information, that's fine. Today's a new day. Tomorrow will be a new day as well. And now sounds like a really great time for you to be thinking about this and potentially seeking out some counseling. Your emotional communication skills with your partner and with your kids are really important too. What a lot of us tend to ignore is that most humans um, really rely on only seven to 10% of what is said. So you may be saying, I'm not mad, everything is fine. What are you talking about? And the rest of you is clearly freaking out as if you have a neon sign over your head that is like, I'm freaking out, I'm so pissed at you. I hate you right now, leave. Um, it, it leaks, it just leaks out of us through our facial expressions, our gestures, the way that we respond to touch. You know, I don't know about you, but if I'm really pissed off at somebody and somebody puts their hand on my shoulder, I'm gonna either turn away or shrink away. I don't want them to touch me. Well, your partner's gonna see that and you are gonna see that from your partner. And so holding back your feelings doesn't keep them hidden. It just creates a dissonance, which creates a broken trust. It says, you're telling me something that's not true and I can see it, but you're not gonna to admit to it. You're gonna deny it. And I see that dissonance. And so now I'm going to create a story in my head of why I see this dissonance. And oftentimes the story that I create is wrong. So not only do I see that I can't trust you to tell me the truth, but I'm also creating a story which might actually not be helpful. It may actually be more hurtful. Um, and so just acknowledging and disclosing the emotions fills in the cognitive gaps and it allows others to more clearly understand what's going on inside of us, inside our mind, inside our bodies. So it's critical for us to practice this because it's easier said than done. And so many people say, I have no idea what to say. And as a therapist, I'm often saying words that they're like, okay, wait a second, let me, let me take notes. What did you say? Because you, you said it really good. 
Well, I said it really good because I've been doing this for 25 years as a professional and also about 25 years as a married human. And so I've had a lot of practice and I'm in the field. So if you're thinking, oh my God, I have no idea how I would honestly and authentically communicate what's going on inside my body. You're just like I was before I started to learn how to do counseling and before I started practicing with my partner. So um, it doesn't come naturally to anybody. Most of us were taught that we should shut ourselves down and be stoic or that, you know, big girls don't cry, big boys don't cry, you know, that kind of emotional heritage and those emotional communication skills that were passed down to us. So again, it's about healing ourselves and healing our lineage forward, basically with our, with our kids and our partner. Um, so practice active listening skills as a basic foundation. Um, and there are some do's and don'ts here. So tuning in and staying curious rather than waiting for your turn to talk or waiting for or planning in your mind what you're gonna say next. Um, making sure that you're trying to understand the experience and what the person is, is communicating to you instead of making the focus the fix. Um, confirm what you hear and make sure you got it right instead of making assumptions um, or rolling your eyes. Because again, your nonverbal is communicating to your partner that you're either open and curious or you are shut down and pissed off. And if you are shut down and pissed off, don't have the conversation. It's not a good time. So take care of yourself. And you can say, I've got to take care of myself because honestly, I, I can't. I'm pissed off. I got, to, I got to walk out of the room. I need some time to myself to take care of myself and self-regulate. And that language, I need to self-regulate, is something that your kids will learn by watching you. So you're teaching them that it's okay not to have a conversation when you're mad, when you're really emotional. Um, so uh, somebody asked, how do we communicate well when we're in the midst of some really intense emotions? Unfortunately, you don't. It's not very skillful when you are really overwhelmed with intense emotions. So the best thing that you can do is communicate that you need time to take care of yourself and to self-soothe. And there are lots and lots of different skills that you can use to do that. Counseling is a great option if you don't have any tools to do self-soothing. Um, you can look online, you can Google, you know, strategies to self-soothe. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to choose some things that you can take care of yourself and then come back to your partner when you are more regulated so that you can communicate verbally and non-verbally in an authentic way. So when you're, recip when you're the recipient, when you are asking um, and, and remaining curious, if you get defensive, it's okay to say, I need to take 10 calm myself down, let's come back to this after a few minutes. Because it is very common in the midst of a difficult conversation for you to get dysregulated and for you to feel defensive. Um, and then the other thing is just be aware how much you're talking. So if you're talking the whole time, the other person is not gonna be able to pay attention the whole time. They're gonna get distracted. They're gonna float away in their own thoughts. They are gonna get to the point where they're thinking about their own response. So if you can see your partner's eyes kind of going this way, that's a cue to you to stop, pause, check in with your partner, see what they have to say. And you might say something like, it looks like you're thinking about something, would you be willing to talk about it? That's it. Um, and that it just gives them an opportunity. First of all, it tells them that you're watching them and that you're curious about them. Second of all, it gives them an opportunity to share in the moment their response rather than, again, be planning this whole argument in their head because that's where they're going to go. Um, so just self-awareness and mindfulness about the process. You do not have to sit there like a robot. You're not a robot. You're a human being and your feelings and your reactions are valid. But if it's too defensive and you're taking it really personally, be aware of that and be willing to take some time. So if you feel dysregulated, you can say, I feel really dysregulated right now. I, you know, you may not even know why. It may be triggering something from your emotional heritage. So give yourself permission to say that to your partner and build that open, trusting, non-shameful, non-judgmental relationship with your partner to where they also get to do that if they feel that way in a difficult conversation. Um, and the same really rules or, or guides are true for conflict resolution skills. But I always like to say, you're not fighting fair when you're name calling. 
when you're blaming everything on the other human, even when you're assuming that everything is the other person's fault, which I did a lot in my early mar marriage days. Um, and again, that was my emotional heritage. I've several, several female, you know, the, the strong female line of blaming everybody else in my family history, um, ignoring or minimizing problems um, and the you always or you never kinds of um, ways of communicating or focusing on I won, ha, ha, ha. That's not fighting fair. And it's fighting in general. It's, it's really not the point. So if you find that you're drawn to chaos and you feel better when you have a lot of chaos and you have a lot of arguments, look at your emotional heritage. Is it healthy? And if you'd like it to be different because your values are for healing yourself and healing your own emotional lineage, get some counseling. My husband and I went to couples counseling several times um, during the last 25 years. And I, I absolutely loved our, um, the psychologist that we worked with, God bless her, she retired after many years of service to, to us and to many others in the Phoenix area. Um, but there are a lot of really great counselors out there. Um, Sorry, how long was I muted? Mere, mere moments. Okay, good. I don't even know. I have, to, I have to apologize. That was totally me. I was trying to admit somebody and I just said, no more. We're done. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Anyway, um, you know, focusing on, on a win versus, you know, and, and again, if you feel like those are the things, if you're drawn to the chaos and, and you really feel like that's that's something you need, Look at the emotional lineage. Is that really healthy? It may have been something that you know your parents and, and your grandparents and maybe everybody else in your family has done, but does it lead to health in their relationships? And if not, can you work on healing the lineage and um, you know for yourself working with a, with a therapist um, like my, my husband and, and, and me did? Um, and the big thing is focusing on the shared values. So when you and your partner decide, you know, these are our shared values, kind of look at it like a dartboard. And when you're playing darts and you're tossing darts at a dartboard, um, I don't really know any dart players who can hit the bullseye every time. You're gonna hit sometimes in the outer rings and sometimes you're gonna hit off the dartboard. But to be a mindful person in a relationship who is interested in a healthy relationship with good problem solving and conflict resolution skills, when you start to hit outer, you know, rims of that dartboard or off the dartboard, um, a mindful person or a mindful couple says, okay, we need to find some time to connect again and look over our shared values again and think about some of the problems that we're having that may need more of our time or more of our attention or energetic investment so that we can get to a resolution because right now we're, we're really off the dartboard on this one. Um, and examine your expectations. So this, it, this, what screws us up most in life is the picture in our head of how it's supposed to be. I think if, if I could see all of, your pic, all of your faces and I could say, how many of you look at social media and you see somebody else who just had a baby and they've got these beautiful flowing in the breeze, you know, maternal pictures looking like a goddess in just the right light just the right makeup and hair and outfit and the baby looks beautiful and the partner and everybody's smiling or the Christmas photos where everybody's wearing the matching outfits and you're like, oh my God, we never do that. I feel like we're failing as a family. I do that all the time. Well, I don't do it as much anymore, but I used to do it a lot when, when my child was young. Um, so sometimes that it's that picture in our head of, of something that's unrealistic for everybody else. I mean, that's just a moment. Somebody that was very, very, um, what do you call it? It, it? Props, you know, that the situation was, was well set up to capture that beautiful moment. And there were a lot of filters involved. Real life doesn't look like that. None of our lives really look like that. And so just recognizing when you're, you're going, oh my gosh, that's a really unrealistic picture. Um, and also thinking like I did, oh, that's not going to happen to me. My, that, that's not going to happen to me and my partner. 
that immediately robs you of the opportunity to connect more deeply with your partner and to create a plan that is actually useful to you. Um, and so there's almost always a discrepancy between the way that we think life is going to be and the way that it actually is, the way that it actually goes. And the greater the discrepancy, the greater the distress. So when you're in distress, sometimes think about it from a perspective of well, what are my expectations and how is my real life different? So when my, when my child was very young, my husband worked nights and weekends. We never saw each other. Um, and I kept saying, this isn't my vision. This isn't my vision. This isn't my vision. And I was very distressed about that. And a lot of it was because my lived experience wasn't at all like the movie I had played in my head with this, you know, beautiful, lovely little family that spent all this time together. And, you know, a husband who wasn't sleep deprived from working at three o'clock in the morning and, you know, a mom who wasn't sleep deprived from being up with her son all night. Um, so I wasn't given the skills in my family of origin to know that there's a reason that this discrepancy is happening and that my lived experience or my reality right now is okay because it just is. Um, and there aren't some things that we can fix right now. And so this is our reality and let's do the best we can with this reality. Let's come together as a partners and let's think about what our values are and how we can hit the mark or hit that bullseye on the dartboard more often than not through mindfulness and emotional um, emotional communication skills um, and by trying to heal some of our lineage um, that we've inherited that is telling us that we're failing when we're really not according to our values. So I love this quote by, by Rumi, you think because you understand one, you must also understand two because one and one make two but you must also understand and. And the thing is when you bring home a baby, it's one plus one plus one. So you've got two ands. So there's a lot of newness there that is ready for you to adjust to, um, but it's that change, that adjustment and the lack of skills, what you didn't know coming into it that you will now learn that often gives us the most hardship and pain. So there are lots and lots of reasons. This is a huge list of things that, that should say to anybody who's looking, maybe try counseling. And I put this little image right here of Dan and Irene's communication problems improve thanks to Richard, their couples therapist. They're both agreeing that the couples therapist is a complete idiot and neither of them can even believe what an idiot he is. And truth be told, that was exactly how we felt about our couples therapist when my husband and I went for the first time. So I laughed so hard when I saw this. I was like, oh, that's what finally brought us together. And then we moved forward from there. So there's a lot of things on this list that, um, you know, are called or considered risk factors for making relationships stressful or, or failure more likely. And Again, I just highly recommend, and I am a therapist, so that is my personal feeling that therapy can help, and it did help me, and it did help us as a, as a couple, um, but it really can help as a prevention. So when you're pregnant or when you're thinking about having children, as well as throughout the fourth trimester. I also like to say um, for dads, one in 10 dads alone, just by themselves, will experience postpartum depression, and that is pre-pandemic data. So we know that the risk for depression in dads is higher now because it's higher for moms. Um, and the risk jumps to one out of every two dads or 50% risk whenever the mother is experiencing postpartum depression or anxiety. Um, and so, you know, there's not a whole lot that we know about LGBTQ plus partners, but we do know that in general as a population, LGBTQ plus individuals experience mood and anxiety disorders at a higher degree. And so the bottom line here is, again, think of counseling as a preventative and also as a highly effective intervention in helping to restore balance and, and harmony and joy in your relationship. Some of the symptoms of depression. Sorry, here. pardon yep. my brief interruption. We just have like about seven minutes left, but, okay. um, but, but I don't want to stop the important slides that you have. So if you yeah. just want to make time for questions at some point. Thank you. I'm really glad you reminded me. Um, I'm going to look over a couple of more things here. So this book, The Relationship Cure, I also highly recommend. It's by the Gottmans and the Gottman Institute. Um, and so one of the things they talk about is these bids for attention that we do. So in successful couples, they use a bid style called turning towards, which is characterized by the use of humor interest in the partner's world, open-ended questions, and work to establish trust and confidence. So again, you have some of the active listening skills 
and the emotional communication skills that we talked about before. Turning away is a bid style, which feels like a bad job interview, which is imagine playing ping pong and the other person like just kind of throws their paddle up in the air and maybe even walks away. Um, so it really, um, it's the partner who is ignoring, um, acting preoccupied, and it leads to hostility, defensiveness, and early divorce. And finally, turning against is hostility followed by suppression of feelings, most often in the female partner. Um, and so it, it really involves sarcasm, ridicule, name calling, some of those not fighting fair skills that we talked about before. Um, and so you're, you're, the way that you respond to your partner's bids for connection really sends a message. And so saying things like, I hear you, I just need some time to myself right now, and then let's definitely talk about this further, or I want to help, I'm on your side, I just don't really know what to do, would you mind telling me? Those are all things that can really make that bid for connection successful and create that ping pong game of communication that flows well. Some of the bid busters here, and you have this in your notes, I won't go deep into it, but they're pretty much things that most people understand here. Having an anxious or a crabby mindset, and this can often be because there's depression, anxiety, not enough time for self-care, um, that you're not getting what you need. Um, emotional flooding, which we talked about before, if you're in the midst of a lot of difficult emotions or it's, it's a hard time, um, it's really a time when you're unable to think clearly or communicate clearly, and it's best to take care of yourself, walk away, and come back. Um, a harsh setup, like, oh, wow, wow, really, really? You're coming to me now with this? Harsh setups are almost always going to be a bid buster. The person's not going to feel like you are open to connecting. Um, mindlessness and avoidance. When you start or when you stay silent to keep the peace, you start a war within yourself. So using that conflict resolution skill or building conflict resolution skills um, to make sure that you can get to that deeper connection. Um, okay, and the last thing I just wanna say is when you positively engage with your partner, whether that's through humor, affection, paying attention during arguments, trying to de-escalate negative feelings, increasing problem solving, increasing positive regard, and repairing hurt feelings more quickly, it is like making a deposit in an emotional bank. So if the bank is empty, you're unlikely to get a partner who is coming to you ready to solve problems. So working on the positive engagement through things like shared rituals, um, which are things here like, um, you know, just sharing coffee in the morning together. Um, it's the difference between brushing your teeth and kissing your kids goodbye. It's something that has an emotional meaning attached to it. The more that you try to create and connect and do that consistently with one another, it's like just putting money in the bank so that when there's a conflict or a problem that needs to be solved, it doesn't feel like you're coming to a person with no relationship there to draw from. Um, the last thing is just to remember that a sound relationship isn't built in a day, it is constructed brick by brick. By brick. Um, and that complex fulfilling relationships don't happen suddenly fully formed. They take work, they take one encounter at a time. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for the reminder. Um, references are included. Please download, download the slides and feel free to contact me with um, further questions outside of today's talk. Thank you so much, Dr. English. Every time we have the pleasure of hearing you, I, there's always so much more to learn. And I feel like it's never enough time because you have so much important stuff to share with us. And so we appreciate you. Um, sure. Thank you. Uh, so in the, in the Q&A on the Whova app, you can continue the conversation and um, ask more questions. If there are more questions or things that didn't get answered, we'd love to hear more. Um, so um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Kara English. And coming up is our last session of the day at 355. Right here in room one, we'll have um, sound healing meditation led by Gretchen Bickert and Jennifer Hoprich. And um, in room two, Bonnie Wiscombe it helps us escape pervasive postpartum emotional slumps. And in room three, 
Dr. Robin Wilhelm helps us navigate the important intimacy after birth. So thank you all. Enjoy your last session of the day. Stick around for the end for our closing remarks and enjoy. Thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate it. And please do download the slides or feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Thank you.